Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for May 21st, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. It is my pleasure to once again bring you the state delegation update. Today joining us is State Representative Denise Provo and State Representative Mike Conley. Denise, how are you doing on this beautiful May day? Well, I'm indoors working. How are you doing? I, I'm indoors as well. Mike, I can see you. You're indoors as well. Indeed, Joe, right here with uh, my cat by my side, just off screen. There you go. Cats are a calming influence, no matter what. But they, they will tell you when they're unhappy, but they are a calming influence. Um, lots has happened since the last time you've joined us. We have a couple of subject matters that we want to get to, but right off the bat, on May 18th, which was Monday, uh, Governor Baker announced his uh, rollout of how we are going to get back to business here in Massachusetts. I'm going to ask each of you, just take a minute or so, give me what your thoughts are on how how the the state plans this slow re-entry into business as not usual. Um, let's start with Mike. Sure. Uh, well, thanks, Joe. You know, um, as you mentioned on Monday, the uh, the reopening plan, reopening Massachusetts, was revealed. And um, you know, on the one hand, I, I know many people are uh, anxious to uh, resume the activities they can. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I've certainly focused on this. You know, I think the uh, concern and the risk with COVID nineteen uh, remains very high, and I suppose as we continue talking, um, I certainly had many criticisms of Governor Baker. Um, and we've heard from folks like our Congresswoman Ayanna Presley just this week who has agreed with those criticisms um, that we have to be very thoughtful and very careful uh, to make sure first and foremost that we don't uh, initiate a resurgence of this terrible disease. So Mike, do you think he's moving much too fast, just about the right speed or too slow? Um, in general, I think too fast, but I would also add, you know, this is very nuanced and certainly in some areas, you know, more may be possible in other areas, we may need to be more conservative. So I think the question really isn't just on the speed, but it's on who's at the table and who gets to make the decisions. And, you know, something that you've already heard us criticize a lot on this show is that this reopening advisory board uh, consisted largely of corporate executives and CEOs. And it's been sad to see that the governor hasn't responded to that criticism because people are still complaining about that to this very day, even though the, pl the plan is already out. So well, we're going to get into some of the particulars of the plan a little later. Rep Provo, what do you think? Governor Baker moving too fast, too slow, or more is needed? <laughs> In some ways, it's hard to tell because it's unclear what the what science his decisions are based on. Um, in in some cases, the the, um, the particulars seem as though they might be plausible. For instance, pet grooming. You know, if it if it um, involves a, a careful handoff of a pet and everybody's wearing face masks and the, you know, the pet is in a cage so you can do six feet. I can see where, where it might be possible to do that kind of an operation without, um, without dangerous inter interactions. But, but for the, the broad brush reopening, I get the impression you're making it up as they go along. And part of it is because even though Secretary Keneally said in a conference call with uh, legislators a couple of weeks ago that childcare and public transportation were essential pieces to reopening, those really haven't been figured out, those essential parts. So we're going to take a deeper dive into that and start weaving that into this conversation today. But something at 1.30 today, I was listening to a reporter on CNN who was describing what happened in Alabama. Alabama lifted most of their restrictions the last week of April. For the first three weeks of May, 
the number of COVID-related hospitalizations has climbed 40% week over week. They are now, at this 21st of May, almost out of ICU beds in the Capitol, in Birmingham, Mobile. And what's happened is that the rural communities are now being hit hard after the, the restrictions were lifted. So if that's a lesson to any of us who have already taken a huge hit here in Massachusetts, in our, our densely populated communities. If that is a lesson, um, hopefully the naysayers saying that we're moving too slow will take a, pay very close attention to that. That's where I wanted to get. Let's go right into, um, Denise, I'm gonna go back to you. We were talking about the reopening. So how do you do the reopening when so many people who wanna go back to work have childcare worries? They also have worries about the schooling of their kids going forward. So here's what may happen in a domino effect. We move too fast. Child care centers can't open because they may not have staff. People can't go back to work. We rush going back to school. And then all of a sudden we have a resurgence. Now we're right back to square one. Let's, I'm going to be quiet for a minute and let you take that narrative about the child care and how it interacts with everything. Well, for about half of the workforce, it is essential. Um, and as, as you know, even though childcare stayed open for about a week after the schools were closed, uh, childcare centers as we know them are still closed until June 29th. Um, however, there was uh, an expedited licensing process for emergency centers to open up for essential workers. And th there's still evidently a lot of um, unfilled seats, shall we say, capacity in the emergency system. And anyone who listened to Governor Baker knows that he advised families to apply for slots in the emergency system. Uh, however, they're, they're in locations that may not be convenient for, lo for working families. Um, they're, they're not known to families and to children who've already had a lot of disruption. Uh, and the other thing is I've been asking uh, the Department of Early Education and Care for more than two weeks to send me a copy of the, the guidance, the COVID safety guidance that the emergency child care centers are using, because that's something people want to know, what precautions are being taken. And it's been, as you would say, sir, crickets. I have not been able to learn anything. And that's worrying. As far as I can tell, Denise, and I have you know younger friends who still depend heavily on childcare. There is the there are the established childcare um, centers mm -hmm. or, or facilities, and then there is this whole other hidden world of childcare, where nannies are involved, or private daycare, or unlicensed daycare. I mean, I, I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but there are a lot of those in the state. How do we ensure the safety of those children when they go back, if they can go back? How do we ensure their safety? That's a key question that I think a lot of people have. Well, if they're family daycare centers, which is to say not institutional, but operating with licenses, they, they are under the supervision of the state and they have very, very rigorous safety, under normal circumstances, safety um, regulations that they have to comply with. But one of the, obviously COVID changes the rules for, for safety. And once the schools closed, I started asking because I was hearing from parents and operators, what are the rules for COVID safety? 
because you might be able to get older children to distance with difficulty, but with infants and babies, you can't. You know, and toddlers, um, children under, under two can't wear masks, um, and they're all about physical. So I was pressing EEC to find out what their COVID regulations were. They never responded until they announced that they were closing all daycare centers. But I thought, it, you know, another reason why it would be helpful to get the regulations for the emergency centers is that would give us an idea what rules everybody are gonna be using once all the centers reopen. But there don't appear to be any emergency regulations or guidance, or if they are, EEC isn't revealing them. So, so it's a problem. Yeah, it is. So before we get into the whole education system, so we're starting at the daycare, to, so a lot of folks can understand how critical that is, either to get people to go back to work, mm -hmm. and how do you do that if they're worried about daycare, get kids to go back to school in September if you haven't got daycare for your youngest and you're trying to go back to school uh, and trying to go back to work. Mike, I'm going to throw it over to you. I know you've taken the heat about um, criticizing the, the plan as it's been presented, but where are you taking the most heat from? Is it the hospitality industry? Is it the small business, you know, the mom and pop boutiques? Where is that coming from? Uh, you know, I think in general, the I've, I've received a lot of support, you know, from the constituents who are in regular contact with me. Um, in terms of the hospitality industry, you know, it is something I've been in, you know, several conversations with the different business associations and people involved with Union Square Main Streets and others. And, you know, it's an evolving picture. And certainly, you know, I think there's also, we have to remind folks that uh, even if we were to say, you know, there's going to be dine-in uh, restaurant service tomorrow, it's not at all clear people are going to come back and want to sit down and eat. So, you know, I, I saw a gentleman from the North End really uh, on, on television on Monday really upset that dine-in service wasn't part of the plan on Monday. But then you look at the polling data, it says, you know, customers, most of them aren't comfortable going back anyways. Um and then one other piece I want to add to it is just to re you know remember, let's not assume that just because Governor Baker declared we're starting the reopening, that we're anywhere near sort of um, the fall off of the peak here. You know, I mean, we, we definitely succeeded in limiting that peak. And, you know, everyone sacrificed, different people sacrificed in, in different ways. And unfortunately... Uh, the, the death toll crossed over the 6,000 number yesterday, um, which is such a tragedy. Um, but we can't lose sight of the fact, you know, we aren't on a nice curve slope downward. What we are facing now is a long, hard plateau. Um, and hopefully that changes. But that's where we're at. You know, two weeks ago, we had nearly 10,000 new cases in that week. Last week, um, we had a, over 8,000 new cases. So these are some pretty serious numbers. So um, back to your question, you know, I think we've seen a lot of support for this cautious approach. And, it, you know, and I, I made the point over the past week in a few different interviews that I did, you know, people would say to me, well, Governor Baker's under all this pressure to reopen. And I'd say, I don't know. I mean, the only public opinion polling that's been done has shown near universal support for uh, the stay at home order. So I think it is important not to conflate um, some of the loudest voices, um, some of those sort of, you know, Donald Trump liberate America type um, protests with, I think, the vast majority of people. Many of the frontline workers uh, are terrified of going back to work, worried that they don't have access to the PPE that they need. I know um, there was, a, I think, a, a nurse protest in front of uh, one of the hospitals nearby the other day um, where nurses are complaining they don't have access to all the PPE they need. So the concerns abound. Yeah, I think what's happening now, Mike, is um, it's becoming region by region and city by city. And that is a mishigas to try to figure out 
when you have a lot of service industry people who may work in Somerville, but live outside of Somerville, when they look at Woburn or Billerica or Framingham loosening some of their restrictions, and then the confusion of not being able to come back to work in Somerville adds to their exasperation because they may see some of their neighbors going back to work in Framingham, but they can't come back to work in Somerville because we're taking a more cautious approach. That's the conundrum that we're gonna have moving forward. And one question I forgot to ask you, Mike, you, you, as I alluded to, you've been the center of publicity over the last week or so. Is it true that you wanna cancel Christmas? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> we're gonna do Christmas on Zoom. <laughs> I, I had to get that in there, Rep Conley, because I read it today. I that I, on <laughs> it was online that, you know, Rep Conley and Mayor Joe Curtitoni want to cancel Christmas. So we're going to get you all Grinch outfits this year. How's that? But go, going back to the conundrum of workers and childcare and education, this is the crux of the problem right now. Yesterday, we had Superintendent of Schools, Mary Skipper, and Chair of the Somerville School Committee on. Um, one of the great announcements they made, and I want to give a plug to them again, is that they are going to do a no-touch graduation ceremony for the Somerville High School kids who have endured four years of disruption up there anyway. So uh, kudos to them. It appears, I read the entire plan, it appears as though they figured it out. And as much as the kids would want to have the traditional, they're gonna take this one and they're very happy with it. But let's go back to Rep Provo and talking about education. Education seems to be a, a highly, highly charged subject matter in this. There are parents who do not wanna send their kids back into that environment. There are educators saying we're losing the kids because virtual teaching is not the optimal way to do this. We have the administrators and the city municipalities struggling with how do we incur that extra expense of keeping these places sanitary and clean for those kids? Do you want to address it from the education standpoint? It's a lot of stuff, but. It, it's a lot of stuff indeed. Um, and, you know, one of the, one of the interesting things about the COVID experience is that all of the inequities that and broken pieces of our society that existed before COVID have been enormously magnified. And so now that we, we've moved to uh, remote learning, the fact that a significant percentage if you, especially if you look at the whole state where some areas don't even have um, wireless internet uh, and have limited and poor quality internet access. And there are many people in urban areas who can't afford it. Then the digital divide becomes um, a disqualification for public education. Um, and you know, and also if you look at, at low income families, there are not places at home for them to, to, to study. Um, they may not have a computer at all. Uh, a lot of them now have been given childcare duties so that their parents can work and they're taking care of their younger siblings. Um, maybe not so much a problem for more well to do families. But in, in some homes, the, the possibility of remote learning is minimal to non-existent. And you and I were talking before the show, and this, once again, tears off that Band-Aid in the mm -hmm. education system that we have been living with for years, and the educators and the parents saying, this needs to change. We need to understand that there is a socioeconomic um, canyon in between the haves and the have-nots when it comes to education. Absolutely. And, and it's also, COVID has shown us that internet access has to become a public utility. 
which is available to everyone. Yeah, I, and I know the city of Somerville has, uh, um, I don't know the particulars of it, but I know the program that they announced to try to get uh, high speed internet access to everyone's home working with Comcast. I know that that's an ongoing project. I don't know what the numbers are, um, but I had an experience very early on with um, uh, Tony Monaco, Dr. Monaco, mm -hmm. from the president of Tufts University, when I feared that some of the kids that we service at the media center were not gonna have laptops, they weren't gonna have high-speed internet. And I reached out to him very quickly. And within two days, his offer was on the table for providing laptops to the kids that we service. So, you know, all too often, no offense to either one of you, but all too often, I think um, government is looked to, to, to solve all of these problems. And I've always been a firm believer that it's going to take public and private partnerships um, to solve a lot of these issues. So to any of my friends who still have a lot of uh, internet, uh, uh, not internet, I'm sorry, um, devices that they could hand over to the Somerville Public School System, I'm sure they'll appreciate it. Um, because moving forward, there's going to be more demand. Um, and that brings us back into, will schools open in the fall? Um, what's your take on it? I'll start with Rep Conley. I know Cambridge is struggling with it, as Somerville is. Um, you know, I think a lot is going to depend on what we see in these coming weeks and, and months, really. You know, I mean, if, if hopefully uh, we see this um, disease and this virus, you know, really come down and we get to a safe place, uh, you know, I would love to see things open. Um, but it's, you know, I think it's, it's up in the air, unfortunately. And if I could just bring one back point back to how you mentioned, you know, there are these concerns around people who live in one city and work in another. Um, right up there, perhaps after education and childcare is the issue of public transportation. And just today, um, I saw a photograph posted online of a bus um, in Chelsea that was, you know, um, quite full, um, you know, with people in the seats and in the aisles. Um, and so one of the issues that's been raised is that the MBTA is maintaining uh, that same limited service that they had back when we were under the stay at home and shutdown of non-essential businesses as we continue the reopening. And as I understand it, they're not planning to resume regular service until uh, phase four, I believe, which could be, you know, at least a couple months away. So Mike, um, why are they doing that? Is that from a financial standpoint or is that because uh, they have no way of knowing how many people are going back to work in week one or week two? I mean, I, I don't understand that decision making. Yeah, it's, it's not entirely clear to me. I mean, I, I um, so I think that's a good question, um, but certainly, you know, ridership has been down overall as we could expect um so there would be you know i think uh even more of a loss than usual would they resume to regular service but um the fact remains we need to maintain as much social distance as we can you know the more we're learning about this virus uh air circulation is important i can't imagine subway cars um are particularly well ventilated in terms of circulating the air um, so I would like to see uh, more, you know, additional capacity and additional service added to the MBTA. And hey, while we're talking about trains, just want to mention um, the Leachmere station, which is important for East Cambridge and all the Somerville buses flow into it. Um, trolley service out of Leachmere will end on Sunday, and that will be replaced with uh, bus shuttles that will actually be running on direct uh, dedicated bus lines on... Uh, Craigie, uh, you know, the, uh, the Route 28 bridge there. Yep, we got you covered on that. I finished up doing a Somerville Media Center special edition with John Dalton, the um, GLX general manager. That's now posted online, but thank you for the reminder. Um, but John also had some very good news is that the Washington Street overpass here in Somerville and the Broadway Bridge are scheduled for opening in June. So let's, let's cheer for our Ball Square, Magoon Square, and our, our Washington Street businesses. One thing I wanted to get to, Representative Provo wants to up, do an update on the evictions. Take it away, Denise. Uh, well, it, 
update. Um, I have become aware that despite the city of Somerville's moratorium on evictions, that there are landlords who are um, trying to evict small business tenants. Um, and also, in, in a roundabout way, their residential tenants, um, mainly by asking for enormous rent increases, which are not strictly prohibited, but are um, will achieve the same end. And I learned this morning um, that a 30 unit building has just, in my district, has received notifications of um, rent increases that are 50% more than folks are already paying. Uh, and I'm going to be asking for help from the Attorney General. And for the individual renter, what is, what is their best course, Denise? I mean, these are critical times. We need speedy answers. We need fast answers. Should they go directly to the Attorney General's office? Well, it, it can't hurt. I would certainly be in touch with the city's Office of Housing Stability um, if, if these individuals potentially qualify for legal services. They should do that as well. But we need, a, I think what the state needs is, is a, a unified response rather than individuals in different places trying to figure it out for themselves. Totally agree. I did catch the town hall here in Somerville the other night and Ellen Schechter was on. And unfortunately, the practice of trying to price somebody out of their apartment by hiking the rent mm -hmm. is not illegal. Um, so that's unfortunate. And that's a conversation for another day because I can see Rep Conley wanting to talk about rent control. I see the bubbles coming out of the back okay. of his head saying rent control. Working One out other, every day. <laughs> yeah. One other thing uh, that's coming up, and maybe we can talk about it next week, is voting coming up in, uh, we have a couple of primaries coming up in September, but we also have the general election. So I'm gonna invite you both back. I promise I won't give that, that uh, subject to anybody else, because I know that's dear to both of your hearts. But anything else on a closing matter before I wanna thank a lot of people for the past 10 weeks participating? One more thing about MBTA, if I may. Um, MBTA has said that riders on the T during reopening are going to have to wear face masks. But last night, the general manager of the T announced that people who fail to wear face masks will be allowed to ride. They won't be excluded. So. You, you know, I, I am all, I am one for all giving, giving people chances. However, um, here in Somerville, it was demonstrated loud and clear. You know, we weren't going to ticket for street sweeping on the first day of street sweeping. And I think well, probably only 30% of the streets got swept because nobody moved their cars. So thank you very much for, for volunteering on that. Hey, listen, I want to thank both of you. And I want to thank both of you for all the weeks that you've been coming on in addition to Senator Jalen, Representative Barber. Um, our shows are unique in that you are not bound by anything. You can say what you want, the subject matter is yours, and it's a little different than when you participate in public hearings and public, uh, public events. So I wanna thank you. I also wanna ask you to do me a favor. I want you to try to decompress this weekend. It is Memorial Day weekend. I want you to close the laptop, put the phone in the back pocket, you still need it for emergencies, and try to get some rest and try to enjoy the beautiful weather that's coming. And you too, Joe. All right. Thank you, Joe, and same to you. Thank you very much. For Somerville Media Center Live, I'm Joe Lynch. Please stay safe, stay informed. Thank you to Denise Provo and Mike Conley. See you next week.